Hello and welcome to episode six of Artists in Their Studios, a production of CSN's Art Galleries and the Art and Art History Program in coordination with CSN's Performing Arts Center and the School of Arts and Letters. My name is Jeff Fulmer, and I am the gallery coordinator at the College of Southern Nevada. Our next featured artist for Artists in Their Studios is Robin Stark. Born in sunny San Diego, Robin Stark received her Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of California at Davis and her Master of Fine Arts degree from the Pennsylvania State University in Co State College, Pennsylvania. Freelancing as a ceramic artist by marketing a body of work at wholesale markets was appealing after graduation, but a move to Nevada in the 90s restored her interest in making one of a kind pieces. At the same time, Stark was working full-time at an architectural firm, coordinating public art and producing graphic design. Years passed and her original passion for art education brought her to the College of Southern Nevada, where she leads the ceramic program as a faculty member in the fine arts department. Throughout her creative profession, her ceramic art pieces have been featured in solo and juried national exhibits, as well as local public art projects. Stark's ceramic work has been awarded an Artist Fellowship, an Artist Fellowship Honorable Mention, and three jackpot grants from the Nevada Arts Council. Robin Stark creates sculptural forms and vessels, which are a fusion of observations of things around her. Inspiration can be found in the texture and color of another ceramic piece, the movement or posturing of the human figure, the complexity yet simplicity of the natural environment, or the arrangement of a particular piece of music. The ceramic forms ultimately transform into an expression of an emotion or idea that become a visual metaphor animated through form color and texture. So we'll join Robin at her home studio now. Hi, I'm Robin Stark, and I'm a ceramic artist and an art educator, and welcome to my studio. Um, as you saw that in that first shot, I had some music going. Music is really important in the studio, as well as, I think another artist mentioned, a good chair, comfortable chair. Um, this is actually my fifth studio. Right out of grad school, I got a space to work, I rented a basement from some friends of mine. They let me put uh, my newly purchased kiln in there, which was awesome. And then my third and fourth studio, they were also basement studios, kind of a typical space for uh, back east, lots of basements. And then in finally moving to uh, Nevada here, I was able to get above ground which was awesome because uh, I had the daylight and also just being able to look out a window and see uh, my yard and uh, the sky were, uh, both those things were really kind of important. So this is a casita and it is about 500 square feet. And I, what I did is when I moved in here about three, four years ago, I took out all the carpeting, um, in a ceramic studio, not a good idea to have carpeting. It retains a lot of dust, and dust is probably the, the biggest hazard in working with uh, clay, for me anyway. I'm pretty careful around other chemicals. So anyway, um, I kind of scaled down from my last studio. My last studio was a thousand square feet. I had separate rooms. I had everything in one space, meaning that I had my kilns there, I had my storage there and my working space. 
but it didn't really have any good heating. It didn't have a bathroom. It didn't have warm water. And in finding this space, I realized at this time of my life, I was really looking for some comfort. And I wanted heating and I wanted cooling and I wanted a bathroom nearby. And I am thrilled to have hot water in my sink. So if I am throwing on the wheel or something like that in the winter time, I can use that warm water. So I did a little bit of a compromise. This is mostly a working space and I'll show you around, kind of do a little close up of some of the things in this space. My kiln and my storage space are in my garage and I'll take you out there. And my office space is in the home. So uh, it worked out really well for me. I really like it. I don't mind too much having to carry my work out to the garage. Um, at this time, I'm really not making super large scale pieces. And if I do, I try to make them in uh, smaller parts so I can actually physically move them myself. I think this space has kind of forced me to be a lot more efficient. Um, I had a lot of stuff in my old studio that I hadn't used in maybe 10 years. So I moved on, kind of got rid of that stuff. Maybe other people can use it. And it also um, made me really get down to what was essential for working. What I, was I really needing to use? And uh, I kind of like that. And I also like having my studio near my home. I've always kind of had it that way. I like to be able to walk right out of my house and into the studio at any time. With uh, ceramics, there's lots of periods where you have to uncover your work, kind of let it dry for a while before you can move on to the next step. And so that works really well. I can work maybe for a couple hours in the morning, leave the work uncovered and then come back and continue working. The other thing that I have found is um, I find I can focus better. Um, my creative energy just kind of flows into the work when I know that I'm not gonna be interrupted anyway. So I've always had a studio by myself. Um, I think as you grow as an artist, you find out what works best for you. And some people work best if they're in a communal space, if they have other people that they see, that they uh, share ideas with. And I guess I just do those things in uh, different formats. So with that, what I think I'll do is kind of uh, take some time to show you around. Um, you are kind of just seeing one angle here and show you where I photograph work, where I store some of my glazes, my drawings, and what I keep in the cabinets, and then how I utilize these shelving units. Okay. But this first space I'm gonna show you is where I photograph my artwork. Um, I have these uh, two pieces of backdrop paper that I utilize depending on what I'm photographing. And an old a photographer friend of mine just showed me how I can use some two by fours with some large holes in them and an aluminum rod to uh, hang my paper on and then just drop it down as I need to. And then when I'm not photographing, I roll it up to keep it protected. So I've kind of put an object on here so you can see a little bit what it would look like. And then I can set my tripod up just right out here next to these lights and uh, photograph my images. And uh, sometimes I use the lights, sometimes I don't, kind of depending on the day. Um, I have opened up all the blinds and the, just the uh, daylight coming in has actually worked. And so sometimes that is a solution. And behind me, I, I have an old filing cabinet. So this is where I keep uh, just archived information. I actually have a, a bunch of uh, slides way back in the day when we still made slides. And I have not been able to get rid of those. I just kind of keep them. And then just, uh, I keep a lot of my old uh, project information for uh, CSN in here. And then these plastic cases I use to store all my glazes and uh, stains, varnishes, under glazes, and my stroke and coats. These are all glazes that you hand paint. Um, that's a surface treatment that I use a lot. I paint with underglazes and then uh, stain them with different kinds of glazes. 
Uh, when I want to actually spray a surface or dip a surface, I use facilities at CSN. One of the things that uh, I did try is I built my own uh, spray booth at my other studio and had it isolated in a room with an exhaust system. And I was able to spray a whole body of work, but it was pretty messy. What you really want is a professional uh, spray booth where you have an exhaust system that really draws the particulates out of the room. Or you can do it maybe outside. Um, this case here has all of my test tiles. I'll show a close-up of this. But every time I am thinking about a surface, I try it on a small piece of clay. And uh, that really helps me come to uh, a solution for surfaces. I always keep them because I'm inspired by them. And I use different parts of them on uh, different pieces. And I have this group sitting out here. I'm just kind of revisiting those. And then down here on the floor, I have a bunch of uh, portfolios where I store drawings that I've done in the past. And I kind of label it and I revisit those as well. I don't really have a case, so this was a solution of storing drawings, so I don't lose track of them. And then my computer. And then I'll kind of move over to this other side of the room. Keep some uh, packing material. So if I'm getting ready to ship something, and then in the cupboards, I have tons of glues and wood putty and fillers, sandpaper, tons of different kinds of nails or hanging devices, uh, screws so I can hang wall pieces, and then photographic equipment and more photographic equipment up here. I can store all my tripods. And then I have um, a bunch of uh, different kinds of paints. Uh, sometimes I use paint to, to uh, fix an area of a ceramic piece that may be chipped off and I can duplicate that surface a little bit. And then colored pencils. And then some other uh, materials that I use for retail shows. And uh, way down here, this is kind of hard to see, but I'll show you a picture. I have all my uh, dry mixing ingredients. So if I flips or on goes with using what we call mason stains, I can also prepare a dry mix. So in my studio, I always try to have an area where I can draw, but it always ends up being a storage area. But uh, I keep trying, I keep clearing it off and making new space, but it ends up being a storage area. And it stores current drawings. Anything that I might be considering doing or revisiting, I just kind of stack those sketches up here. And then when I'm really ready and have time to pursue them, I can put them up on my board here. I have some stuff that I've seen in magazines, uh, things that inspire me, and then maybe some sketches of some new pieces that I want to pursue and hopefully not forget about. This is a light table that I use a lot when I'm drawing. Um, I'll do several um, versions of a piece and instead of trying to draw it new, I just set it on the light table, trace the basic outline, and then I can put the colors in. And you know, you could probably do all that on the computer but I'm sort of old fashioned in the way that I like to use colored pencils and I just like the feel of uh, executing something by hand. It's part of the process for me. It helps the idea evolve. And then right here I have uh, a shelving unit that contains all the boards that I work with. Um, and then these two shelving units, um, this one has a lot of different shapes on it, either in wood or ceramics that I use as molds to help create other forms. And then I have a, a group of about four rolling pins here that I use to roll out slabs and various size sticks to control thickness. Uh, canvas material, plastic, drawing paper. Here's, these are little tiny mockettes. Uh, pieces that I've made and it really helps me uh, resolve the form in a three-dimensional way when I can build it small I can go take my drawing 
go to the maquette, and then I can scale this up to whatever size that I want. So I do that frequently, and I've kept all the maquettes, kind of fallen in love with them. And then way down here is usually where I store uh, pieces in progress. And I have some work that's in various stages. Some are complete, some are bisque fired and need to have the glaze stain. And then I have others that are uh, greenware and that they're just in the drying process. And then I have things that I'm kind of working on, you know, potentially some new ideas, something that I need to still resolve. We have like a 3D sketch wheel over here. So I can just quickly pull this out if I want to do some wheel throwing. And then I have a station over here where I can do some slip casting. Um, that's something new that I really want to pursue because I can do replicates and I can do them without it taking me a couple days. Um, I want to do more of these cubes. I've had to scale it down so I can uh, actually manage the mold by myself. And I think it's about uh, six by six. That was the size that we came up with. So I'll go ahead and do some close-ups so you can uh, see some of this. So as I leave my studio, I have to uh, walk around the house to go out to the uh, garage. So I'd be carrying my pieces. Or... And here I am finally arriving at the garage door where I can enter into the storage in the kiln area. So this is where I come through into the garage and I carry my pieces over to my kilns. Actually, I have a table right out of view here, the camera, but I can just bring the pieces to the table before I load them up. And I have two kilns. I have a large one that I bought right out of grad school. And then I have a smaller one that I, I bought a few years back. Um, I actually have another piece that I can fit in this one. So I can have uh, some really tall pieces if I wanted to fire those. I just have to take off this top section, insert the piece, and then put the top section back on. And I'll show you another picture, but uh, right within the kilns, I have all the shelving for stacking work and posts over here in my boxes. And I have these two large fans, so I kind of had to work out a whole other way to, um, to exhaust the fumes from firing because there are some fumes. And before I had a, a separate room, I had a really strong industrial fan and I could draw the fumes out. So this time what I do is I just open the door here and I open the window over here, sometimes crack the garage door. And I have these uh, two very large fans, this one and also the tall one down at the end. And I can move the air through that way. The other thing you have to do is for the kilns, I have to have a special electrical outlet to plug them in, and it needs to be connected to a 220 line. So uh, that's something you have to consider when you're moving, is um, you need to hire an electrician, have an electrician as a friend, someone that can help you do that. This is where I store uh, artwork that's not currently being exhibited, or uh, I just need to move it out of the studio so I have more working space. And actually, most of these boxes are empty. Work is, uh, anytime we can get it out in the community on exhibit, I try to do that. So these are, many of these are just empty. And then just some empty moving boxes. So if I have to move pieces from the studio to here, I can also carry them in here. Over here, I have some, uh, some other work, these are uh, functional pieces that I sell at retail shows, do a couple small retail shows in a year, and can sell mugs and bowls and uh, things of that nature. These are mostly my ceramic sculpture that I usually display and have on my website, and I sell through those venues. And then down here at the bottom, you can just see that other section of my kiln that I uh, have. And then I have some other tools here, uh, saws and other equipment that I have to store here if I'm not currently using.
This is my office space. Um, I actually share this room with my husband. He's uh, behind me, has a couple of monitors and a computer over there. But uh, part of being an active artist is uh, maintaining your images, uh, filling out applications for exhibits, uh, proposals to do public artwork, or uh, proposals for grants. So uh, you kind of need a space to do that as well. I just have an image up here of a wall piece that I've recently photographed, have it in Photoshop, and uh, taking care of any enhancements and resizing it for uh, anything that I may submit it to. And I also keep a visual record uh, I call it my index of all the pieces I've made since actually moving to Nevada. I have the title of the piece, its dimensions when I made it, and if it's uh, for sale and the uh, price. That way if I decide to submit to an exhibit, I can just come in here and go to the index and I have all that information. And I don't have to go locate the piece and remeasure it, which can be really cumbersome and a selection of ceramic books keep on hand. So I'm back in my studio here. I'm going to end the uh, video here. I just thought I would talk a little bit about inspiration. I'm mostly going to just talk about my latest piece of sculpture. Um, have some of my drawings here that I transfer images onto the cube form and it's a piece of sculpture where I'm creating this nine block sculpture and each side will uh, when they're put together will portray an overall image and those images are they're drawn from some previous wall pieces that I've done and what I do is I'm using a lot of pattern shapes and colors to uh, express certain childhood memories, nostalgic feelings, and uh, most of it, uh, the shape, the colors, texture, are all associated with some kind of emotion or thought. And uh, sometimes the energies involved with those thoughts or emotions are, uh, they're interconnected, they're scattering, they are colliding, and, uh, doing those different things. And I've also included, uh, I've been doing some uh, bird images, so they're part of uh, one side of the sculpture. And I'm gonna get busy building for more blocks here. This one is one of the first ones, and it is done. And that is kind of where I'm going to end the video. And I look forward to your questions. Wow. Thank you, Robin. That was a really cool behind the scenes look at your studio and, and into your work. I have quite a few questions in the chat and I'm going to get to just as many of them as I can. We've got uh, just uh, 10 minutes left in our, our 40 minute Zoom session. Uh, so we'll just get to as many questions as we can. Michaela asked about the piece that you just described. So in a uh, uh, in the spirit of uh, our short amount of time, I'm going to move on to Daryl's question. Uh, Daryl asked you about dust. He said, you talked about dust. What kind of health measures do you take to protect yourself? Uh, well, the first thing I did was get rid of the carpet so that the clay particles don't accumulate. And what I do is uh, after I'm working, I either sweep or I vacuum and I mop the floor. And that really handles a lot of the dust. And I just have to, I can't be an artist that just kind of lets it go because it really stirs up my allergies. So that's mostly what I do. Yeah. Very good. Uh, Shannon asked about uh, seeing more test tiles. Um, and, and I know that those are something that, that maybe you don't have on your website, but maybe this would be a good time to plug where we can see 
even more of your, your finished work too. Yeah, sometimes uh, I even just make a mug and that becomes a textile, you know? Yeah, there you I go. I got one of Robin's mugs here that I've mugs. been sipping from. A lot of different glazes and surfaces, but they usually do, they just start out as a chip or, you know, that's just a color chip. So that doesn't show much, but uh, yeah. What if we wanted to see more of your finished work? Pardon? Where can we see more of your finished work? Oh, on your website. Or... Yeah, it's uh, robinstarkstudio.net. Robinstarkstudio.net. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, Anne asks um, for you to tell us more about your imagery and influences. And you did a little bit, but maybe you can go a little bit deeper um, into that. Influences. Uh, boy, that's a good uh, question. That would be Anne's question. <laughs> Um, I guess, like I said, just looking at the things around me, um, I tend to see a lot of form and pattern in the environment, in the natural environment. And uh, usually it's connected with an emotion and or a thought. And then, you know, color gets associated with those things as I insert that. Um, I look at a lot of paintings. I'm influenced by the Impressionist, the Post-Impressionist, Cubist. You know, a lot of those type of styles, uh, abstract expressionism, abstract art. Um, it may seem strange, but I actually look at sometimes more paintings than I do 3D art, because uh, the form is kind of derived from the environment or something, or from the figure for, uh, from architecture. But the color and the other stuff sometimes comes from 2D art. Great. Several uh, people talked in the chat about uh, your organization, how, <laughs> how organized you seem to be. Um, one asks if it was difficult to be so organized. And, and I, I know you as the most organized artist um, that I know. So um, maybe you can talk a little bit about, about that and how that influences how that your role. I think it evolved because uh, when my in my first studios, I had such little room and I had to figure out a way to make big things in hardly any space. I mean, my studios, uh, one of them was like just two hallways in a basement. So I think that that really forced me to, to start to be really organized. And then it just kind of carried over. Um, I did have a really large stool, uh, studio, I was able to, uh, to really spread out, but then I had pets. I had uh, three cats in the studio. So with that, they can, they can get into your materials, which is dangerous. They can destroy your work, which is complicates your relationship with them. <laughs> and so I think those things have really influenced that organization and uh, stuff like that. That uh, ties in really well with Eileen's question. Um, what advice would you give to beginning ceramicists who have smaller spaces? Hmm. Uh, what would be the essentials needed to have a successful ceramic studio for a beginner? Well, you, uh, you may know if you are predominantly uh, going to use the pottery wheel or maybe hand building um, techniques to, to make your work. So that'll kind of determine a lot. But for me, the most essential thing was to get that kiln because no matter what tools you use, you're gonna have to fire it and to really finish it. So some kind of small kiln would be an awesome start. And in a place where, you know, most likely in a garage where you can fire it and you can hook it up easily to uh, your electrical box. And I mean, you could set up in a, in part of a bedroom, you know, <laughs> like I said, in a corner of a room and uh, just be clean, you know, so it doesn't infiltrate the rest of your living space. So I don't know, is that helpful? I hope. I, I think so. Uh, Mariah had a question kind of similar related to that for the beginning artist. Um, any, any advice about purchasing supplies and materials, how expensive and, and 
and maybe any ideas for getting um, your, your studio equipped on yeah. a budget? I think you need to kind of think about what kind of materials do you want to use? You know, um, I've always been kind of zoned in on color. So that kind of determined the type of glazes, you know, um, on gubs, mason stains, under glazes, low fire uh, glazes, because that's predominantly where you're going to find color. And, and, you know, in truth, I don't think any of these things are very expensive. I don't think the materials you need uh, or the tools you need are expensive. What's expensive is going to be that kiln or that pottery wheel. So I think you can, you can get yourself up and working really cheaply. And clay's not that expensive. Buying, you know, a couple hundred pounds of clay that's already pre-mixed is not going to, it's not going to put too big of a dent in the budget. I know my, my wife and I started with ceramics using butter knives and, and kitchen forks for, oh, for yeah. a lot of, and, our, and your fingers. Yeah, the, the, anything the around it can be used and you don't need much. And it, it amazes me, all these people who go out and buy all these fancy tools and, you know, you, you just really don't need it. You don't need expensive brushes. I, you know, I use three types of brushes and they're cheaper brushes because you go through them so rapidly. Right. So, yeah. Uh, Suzanne said that she'd really like to see your, your cubes in a really large scale, like installation type of work. Wouldn't that be fantastic? So would I. <laughs> <laughs> Originally, I envisioned them being like 18 inches by 18 inches, but physically, I just couldn't do it. You know, right. so I got it, it, it a range that I could manage. You Maybe. go to 18 inches, then you want to go to 36 inches, and then you want to fill yeah. the room. And then pretty soon you think, maybe I should just start using steel and have someone weld them for me. <laughs> but then I'd have to hire someone to move them for me. Well, we weren't able to get to all the questions in the chat, but uh, Zoom is telling me that we have less than a minute. So I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to uh, join you in your studio to look around. Um, if you do have follow-up questions, robin.stark at csn.edu. Uh, yeah, thank or, you, or visit Jeff, your website. Thank everyone who attended. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. So this has been Artists in Their Studios, a production of CSN Art Galleries and the Art and Art History Program in coordination with the CSN Performing Arts Center and the School of Arts and Letters, featuring artist and educator Robin Stark. My name is Jeff Fulmer. You can find the CSN Art Galleries online on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and on our WordPress blog where this archived video will be housed. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and stay healthy, everybody. Bye.